once a year this scary box opens with its goofy host. Containing out their comics that deserve a right good roast. And if this book stars a severed head, well, that's your gain. As we open up one more time, the short box of the inane. Yeah, what's all this then? My chiropractor promised me this one adjustment would take away all the pain in my neck. Speaking of being a pain in the neck, welcome back to the Short Box of the Inane. I'm your host, the Last Angry Ghouly. Now we're going to have to soldier on with this screwed up head of mine, but maybe that's for the best as today we're going to be reviewing a comic about a soldier with a screw on head as we review that story and more in The Amazing Screw on Head and Other Curious Objects. The Amazing Screw on Head was a one-shot comic released by Dark Horse Comics in 2002, written and drawn by Hellboy creator Mike Mignola. The one-shot proved to be so successful that even today it remains a very popular comic. The Sci-Fi Channel produced an animated adaptation of the comic, with the likes of David Hyde Pierce, Patton Oswalt, and Paul Giamatti providing voices. Eventually, a hardcover collection was released reprinting the comic with over 60 pages of news stories, commentary, and sketchbook art all by Mignola called... The Amazing Screw on Head, and Other Curious Objects. Most recently, IDW Publishing released an oversized black and white version of the hardcover as part of their Artist's Edition series, trying to recreate the original artwork that Magnola submitted as closely as possible. Uh, oh, oh. oh, that's better. <laughs> well, this comic collection of short stories is from the man who created Hellboy. Now, you might think he's a self-made man, but in actuality, He's already rich, having inherited a fortune from the company that his family founded in Japan. Stand back, everyone. Here it comes. No, you know. Everyone knows that Hellboy was created by Mike Minolta. Like Minolta, the camera company? <laughs> anyway, let's review the amazing screw head and other curious objects. You know, they revolutionized comics with the disposable right hand of doom. Oh, better be careful there. Oh. Well, it's alright, I already have two black eyes. <laughs> Here's the amazing screw on the head. Ooh. President Abraham Lincoln puts out the word. He needs the amazing screw on head. Head bounces past an army of headless bodies to a video screen. According to the president, a museum of dangerous books was attacked. The use of poison gas and scorpions points to head's old arch enemy, Emperor Zombie. The untranslatable Kalakistan fragment has been stolen. Head calls his butler, Mr. Groin. He's going to need a body. They screw him into body number 13, as Head explains. The fragment details the life of Gung the Magnificent, who ruled the world nearly 10,000 years ago, with power granted to him by a melon-sized jewel. If the fragment tells where to find that jewel, then the entire planet is in danger. Before he died, Emperor Zavi was a professor of ancient languages, perhaps the only man who could translate the fragment. Groin reiterates, All intelligent people should be cremated for national security. Well, that makes sense. Sign me up. We only cremate intelligent people. You don't qualify. But everyone in that Ponzi scheme I joined said I was smart. Mr. Dog, a three-legged mongrel in a barometric chamber, locks onto Emperor Zombie. He's in Spain, likely headed to the worst place on Earth, the Aswam Valley. With the President's blessings, Head, Mr. Groin, and Mr. Dog are shot out of a bullet-shaped capsule towards the valley. Meanwhile, Emperor Zombie, the Madam, a vampire, and the ingenious Dr. Snap have discovered the tomb of Gung. This calls for evil laughter. <laughs> Under the guise of a harpy, we find Gung's mummified remains holding a box. The prerequisite creepy whisper tries to warn Zombie, but he shoots it dead. Uh, deader. The jewel will grant him unlimited power, and with that, the world shall be... And it's just a dirty old turnip. But Snap detects a parallel universe inside the turnip. As Head and Company arrive in the valley, the capsule is shot out of the sky by zombies' minions. Head jumps ship to deal with the Emperor, his body being shot up in the fall. Snap inserts a probe into the vegetable and disappears, replaced by a gigantic frog god. This monster will rain doom on them all. <laughs> head drops through the roof, but Emperor Zombie is more than happy to surrender. The monster bats Head away, ignoring him. But he works for Abraham Lincoln and shoots a fist into its maw. An explosion collapses the temple. Groin and Dog find Head digging himself out of the rubble with Emperor Zombie making a somewhat fast getaway on his dirigible. 
and the dirigible's anchor spears Head's body, dragging him behind them. Zombie will take out his anger on the entire world. No amount of suffering is too evil for them. He asks his vampire companion, which shall it be? Poison frogs? Plague-infested rats? A gigantic fire-breathing robot? The madam finally speaks out loud. Why not all three? Tired of mentioning two opposing things that don't match in any way only for your friends to spam your social media with a gif of the Why not both girl from that taco commercial? Well, render that idea invalid by adding a third thing. Yes, with a third thing, that annoying gif slash meme slash YouTube clip will be completely unusable. Just down the number below and we'll send you, for a reasonable charge, shipping and handling included, foreign and domestic taxes applied, a third thing. But wait, what if the third thing arrives and you've already got one thing but not two? Then you're opening yourself up for a why not both shaming. In that case, for the all-time low cost of triple what you were going to pay anyway, we'll send you three third things all at once. Oh, well, that's great! But what are these things? You let us worry about that. Just send your personal check, money order, and or mostly and copies of your daddy's credit cards to third things, post office box 333, Tripoli. The last angry geek DVD! I'm ruined! <laughs> Emperor Zombie is so taken by her suggestion of mass destruction, he drops to one knee and proposes. Heads, uh, head, bursts through the floor, interrupting this romantic moment as the madam turns into a bat again and escapes again. Head bites into a thick wire. The dirigible explodes. Mr. Lincoln expresses his gratitude to screw on head. Then some old-timey gentleman wanted to show us the amazing screw on head's origins, but it's a secret. Here's some pictures of witches and a monkey instead. I didn't mean to steal that pack of gum. I just needed something to plug up the holes in the end. Oh, uh, we now return to the amazing screw on head and other curious objects. We'll conclude this review with quick non-spoiler reviews of the remaining stories, but in some cases, I will protect the identities of those involved. Especially stupid farm boys named Jack. First up is a tale of the young Emperor Gung and a beanstalk, as told by Professor Stoop. Gung, of course, being the ancient world conqueror whose tomb was explored by Emperor Zombie and crew. This story gives a sort of eastern take on Jack and the Beanstalk as Gung, barely out of diapers, agrees to help two destitute sisters by climbing a beanstalk growing out of their third sister's corpse. Oh, she sold her family's jewelry for magic beans and then swallowed them once her sisters started to beat her for being stupid. This, of course, leads to a confrontation with the devil living at the top of the beanstalk and Gung outwitting the creature to the benefit of the women. The next story is The Magician and the Snake, co-written by Mike Mignola with his daughter Katie, who was only seven years old at the time. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, it's true. This is A Magician's Hat. It was willed to me by my great uncle Sven Garlic, and now I will hold the hat in front of my crotch, and having taken Viagra before the show started, I will wave the magic wand and summon a snake. <laughs> That's barely bigger than an inchworm on a cold day. A magician appears before a monkey king and impresses him by making three solid objects disappear. Amazing! But the magician went too far. By making those objects disappear, he rose above his station in the universe. They will eventually return, and on that day he will die. The magician and his best friend, a snake, have to deal with these inescapable consequences. Actually, the three objects are extremely important to the lore of Magnola's most famous creation, Hellboy, as they play into the character's end in the final Hellboy series that Magnola wrote and drew, Hellboy in Hell. Although we never get any real answers as to why these objects are so important in either book, when they show up in Hellboy, it's a nice callback and implies a sort of universal order, if nothing else, to Magnola's universe. The next story is The Witch and Her Soul. It's the simple story of a woman who sold her soul to the devil for arcane powers and created two living puppets, and what happens to them when the devil comes to collect that soul after she dies. The next tale is How Dr. Snap Murdered Professor Cyclops and What Came of It, or The Prisoner of Mars. At a pub called The Magician and the Snake, several learned men are talking about their recent troubles, but Dr. Stamp wasn't aware of anything, as at the time he was put on trial for his life and executed. What then follows is the tale of a meteorite landing on the property of Stamp's compatriot, Dr. Cyclops, and the life form contained within. Ow, quit it! Ow, quit it! Ow, quit it! We now return to the conclusion of The Amazing Screw on Head and Other Curious Objects. Now, if only I could think of a really good excuse to get out of hanging with mad scientists. Although Dr. Cyclops calls him for help, Snap was busy performing experiments involving a certain root vegetable. Eventually, Snap discovers Cyclops has become a zombie, kills him, dies himself, and travels to Mars where he gets a robotic body and explores the Martian culture with his old friend Cyclops, himself now a consciousness inhabiting a Martian corpse. You know, that old chestnut. The final story isn't a story at all, but a quick visit to the Chapel of Curious Objects. 
And the last part of the book is Magnola's story notes and then a sketchbook of the art he worked out for the series. And there you have it, the amazing screw and head and other curious objects from the mind of Mike Magnola. But was it worth twisting this book open or do I just not understand the mechanics of operating books? Uh, let's take a closer look at the amazing etc etc. Well, first off, this is Magnola's art style at its finest. Bullet-shaped bodies, visually engaging scenery, and page structure that suggests motion. While Mike doesn't spend a huge amount of time drawing exact details on his characters, that doesn't mean he underdraws by any means. Each character looks unique. Every page is a masterpiece of directing your eyes through the story. He's one of the finest storytellers working in comics, and this visual style of his is a huge part of that. At no point can you ever call his stylized art uninteresting. As for the story itself... While Hellboy is a very serious universe inhabited by a character determined not to take it seriously, Screw on Head and its stories are the exact opposite. The characters take their stories very seriously, even though they are lighthearted and silly. We're talking about a robot head that acts as a secret agent for Abraham Lincoln with as many bodies as Tony Stark has suits of armor, versus an undead intellectual with a vampire girlfriend who travels the world in a dirigible looking for unlimited power to conquer the Earth. We're talking evil puppets. A bromance between wizard and reptile. A dead man's soul going to Mars to thwart an invasion. All fun adventures to be sure, but extremely unlikely and, to a certain degree, silly. But Magnola just has fun with these stories, imbuing them with a lighthearted sense of play so that you never take them too seriously and just strap in to have a good time. Screw on Head is obviously an homage to the pulp heroes of the day, your Phantom, or more recently your Indiana Jones. There's an adventurer on a globe-trotting journey to stop an over-the-top villain from discovering an awful weapon from the past. Tombs are raided, monsters unearthed, and explosions follow. On the other hand, Dr. Stamp's adventure is equal part Orson Welles' War of the World, H.P. Lovecraft's The Whisperer in Darkness, with a touch of John Carter on Mars. What should be the story of a cold alien intelligence focusing evil intentions on Earth ends up as a sort of Abbott and Costello, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, bumbling do-gooders travel log. The Witch and Her Soul is probably the most Hellboy-like story. In fact, it reads like a Hellboy story without Hellboy. There's the devil, a soul in jeopardy, magical artifacts. Actually, the best written story here is probably the one Magnola wrote with his daughter Katie, the magician and the snake. It's surprisingly emotional and really, at its heart, it's a story about making the most of the time you have together when you know someone you love will die. The snake is that person who wants to fight against all odds, and the magician has accepted his fate and knows he will live on in the snake's heart. It's really beautiful, and I confess to getting a little choked up. Finally, Young Emperor Gung's story is just a different version of Jack and the Beanstalk, except set in a sort of Pangea or ancient Asian society. Instead of a mother and her son, you have three formerly wealthy sisters. Instead of a giant, you have a devil, but that antagonist's demise leads to financial salvation for both sets of characters. Magnol is a master of blending two separate ideas to make a unified story. He does it all the time in Hellboy. Here, he does something similar but different. He takes an idea where we already know what will happen and wraps it in the tellings of another culture. So we still recognize it, but it seems older, different from what we remember. Without a doubt, this is a fun book with tales that draw from a myriad of different inspirations, a real example of how wonderful storytelling can be in comic books. I give The Amazing Scrum Head and Other Curious Objects five out of five stars. I really think you'll get your money's worth with this collection, and if you're like me, it's one you're going to read over and over again. Speaking of endless repeats, on our next episode, I'll... I'll have to answer this door so we can end this video. Excuse me. Because if the video doesn't end, then how is the YouTube algorithm going to know when to bury me? Mr. Oh. Gooley, is it true this year's short box review was originally going to be the comic centipede? Well, yes, that is true, but I had to change it at the very last minute due to some technical problems. Did you know that the amazing Scrawn Head once had to fight a giant centipede in the Antarctic? What? But upon his arrival, his body shattered due to the freezing temperatures. Oh my gosh, what did they do? Well, fortunately, the natives helped him reassemble his body using their houses for building well, material. How did they do that? You said his body was shattered. But fortunately, it glues together. Oh. Dad joke alert. Dad joke alert. Oh. Oh, I wish I had a kid, although there were those goats I raised. Or was that braised? Oh, well. Thank you for joining us, my friends. I'm your host, The Last Angry Ghoulie, and I hope to see you back here next year for another dip into the crazy, cool, stupid world of the short box of the inane. Actually, my nanny was a goat. And I guess that makes me the black sheep. Although I shouldn't make those noises. You never know when uh, I might...
get sheared. <laughs> Although this uh, outfit is pretty heavy. It's pretty warm, actually. A good shearing would be pretty cool right now, though it's October, so I'd freeze. I, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>